Great to be back for day two of Foss Backstage. I hear the coffee is great. I'm really gutted to not be there with you in person. Unfortunately, my partner has COVID, so I wasn't able to travel. Uh, but maybe next year. Fingers crossed next year. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can improve the contributor experience in open source projects and a little bit about our journey in the Mortic community and some ideas, some ways that we might think about smoothing out that process for our contributors. So for those of you I haven't met before, my name is Ruth Cheesley and my pronouns are she, her. I'm based in Ipswich in the UK and I've been around open source for about 18 years or so, mostly contributing in the Joomla project and more recently in the Mortic project. And I work full time for Acquia as project lead. And these notes and some resources and hopefully a subtitled recording will also be up on my notice page afterwards. So I'll tweet out the link. You should be able to access that and get all of the things that I talk about. So why am I interested in the contributor experience? So I think it's fundamental to open source to make sure that we have a good experience for people who want to contribute in whatever way they can with whatever skills they can. But quite often we end up thinking of the contributor experience as starting sort of when someone is at the point that they're interested in contributing. For me, the contributor experience is that human experience it starts right at the very first interactions with your open source project. And it continues all the way through the journey that that person has with your open source project. The first impressions they have, those first experiences they have will fundamentally shape whether they might consider contributing in the future. So we need to go right back to the start before we start thinking about all the highfalutin ideas of how we can improve the actual contribution side of things. So there are some basic fundamentals that we really have to get right before we think about anything in the open source communities. Anyone who comes to your community really needs to make sure that they feel safe and welcome in the community, particularly if they're from a minority group that they don't necessarily see well represented in your community. And some of the ways that you can help with that is making sure that you're actually contributing people in, uh, supporting people who are contributing in a positive way so that when someone from the outside looks into your community, they see people getting supported in making contributions. If someone makes a mistake, they're being supported in a positive way instead of belittled and made to feel small. And that gives an impression, yeah, actually, that's the kind of support I'd like to improve my skills and my experience. But also from the outside, new contributors are looking at things like how is inappropriate behavior dealt with in this community? Are people being snarky and unkind and rude in the issue queue? Is there this kind of cliquey banter going on and like there isn't anything being done about it? Because that also will affect whether people are actually will consider contributing to a project in the first place. And really, I feel like it's the responsibility of the, the maintainers, the leads of the project, whoever that is, to actually set that bar and, and enforce that bar to improve that experience for everyone in the community. So those are some of like, almost like the foundational things that need to be in place in order to, for there to be a good contributor experience in the first place. But when we start talking about contributions, what do we actually mean? Historically, we've thought of contribution code and a lot of the sessions yesterday, it was so much more than code that people can contribute in open source projects. In the Mortic project, we have loads of different ways that we actually track and consider contributions. These are just some of them. And it's really important that when you are looking at the contributor experience, you're looking at how that is across everywhere that people are getting involved with your project. So we track these places within our system and each time someone does one of these things, they're given a a contribution credit effectively. Podcasts, we actually consider things that are altruistic, so they're just there to help the, the growth of the community, not sort of sales focused um, podcasts. And yeah, content and things that are written on the blogs. But we also consider other things like attending a team meeting. You're taking time out of your day to attend and participate in a team meeting speaking at one of our conferences or representing our project at another conference. 
helping someone getting onboarded and supporting them through the onboarding process, all of those things are positively helping our project. So we feel like it's important that they're considered as a contribution. And I actually came to open source through running user groups, through leading um, ma the marketing team and through documentation. So I don't come from a traditional uh, background. So for me, it's really important in our project that we do that. And we found that that's been really successful because people are feeling like they're valued and then therefore they're contributing more in whatever way is, is right for them. And ultimately, I, I talked at the start that really it's, it's a journey that these people go on. So they, they start off as what we call users in our project. And you'll have to forgive me, you know, marketing background, marketing project, this is a bit of a marketing analogy, but hopefully it, it makes sense. So we have the users at the top who are people who use the open source software, but they don't actually contribute at all. And we sort of have a bit of a funnel. Those users go on to, some of those users will go on to become what I called helpers. So they, they maybe make one or two contributions. Usually it's things that they care about. They don't, they don't contribute regularly. There's no kind of consistency in that. And then we have regular contributors who I've called makers, people who are consistently and regularly making contributions to help improve the project, whether that's responding to forum questions, whether that's writing articles, improving knowledge base articles, running a meetup, whatever. These are the people that are helping to make your open source project. And some of these, but not all of them, will go on to become the deciders, the people who are actually setting the future of the project. So these might be team leaders, they might be project leaders, they might be maintainers, core team, whatever you call them. So it's a bit of a funnel that we have going on with the contributor journey. And a lot of the time in open source project, the projects, the focus is all on getting more people in the top. We need to get more people coming in the top and using the product and then making their first contribution. But there's not so much focus on the leakiness of the funnel. So that's something I feel like we need to improve in our contributor experience, is to improve those leaks in the funnel so that if we plug them up, when we get more users at the top, we're more likely to have more users coming through and becoming regular contributors and potentially the deciders. So for me, Focusing on fixing the avoidable leaks in the funnel, so where we could have actually kept that contributor in the project, that brings long-term benefits and sustainability to your project. So it's something that's really well worth investing time in. So what I'm going to do is talk about each of those steps and how we can fix the leaks, how we can actually get people to, to move down through the funnel at the project level, at the team level, so team you can replace with whatever's relevant for your own project, and also at the local community level, so local meetups or whatever, ways that we can try to bring people down the funnel and retain them in that funnel. So let's dive in to start with about taking the first step. So this is often the first hurdle, the first kind of um, roadblock people might hit is making that first contribution. And to investigate this a bit, in the Maltic project, we did a user survey. So we sent out a survey to everyone who uses our product. And we asked them stuff about the product, but we also asked them, do you contribute financially? Do you contribute practically in terms of your skills and resources? And if they don't contribute, did they know they could? If they don't contribute, why is it that they don't contribute? If they do contribute, how do they contribute? And what, what is it that's preventing them from contributing more if they feel like they're able to contribute more? So some of the examples I'm going to use are taken from the results we had from that survey, and it was really, really helpful. So definitely something I would suggest doing to learn a bit more about the user experience from your users of your product. So this first example, is someone who uses our product. So in our case, it's a marketing automation tool. And so our users, generally speaking, tend to be marketers. And they're using the product as part of their job. They probably like search for things when they're having problems and they land on our community resources when they need help, but they don't actually contribute to the project. 
And this one made me a bit sad because the, the one of the things that came out from this bunch of people was they didn't feel like they had any skills that would be worthy or valuable to the community, which kind of made me sad because everybody has skills that are valuable to an open source community. And then the second chunk of the um, discussion from these people was that they don't know how to find out what they might be able to contribute to. So the main reasons or the pain points we found from this group were that they didn't know their skills could be helpful. They didn't know what needs to be done. They hadn't actually had any call to action or direct invitation to get involved either. So they didn't really know that their help was needed. And they didn't really feel like they were part of our community. They felt like they were a bit on the periphery of the community. So some of the things that we could do at the project level to get these people engaged, to start them moving through that contributor funnel and start them to become a helper, to help out with a few things. Fundamentally, awareness of the open source principles and culture, the fact that this software you're using, these resources you're accessing, it's all community generated and supported. And you can be a part of helping that. You can be a part of creating that for others. Clearly documenting ways for people to contrib contribute, including financially if they don't have the time resources to contribute. So we have our community handbook at contribute.multic.org where we list out a bunch of contributor roles with explicit examples of the kind of tasks we have, where to find the task list for those projects, which Slack channels to join, which JIRA boards to look at, who to contact. It's been really, really helpful because we can point people straight at the right place. We also have a, a new contributors onboarding team slash channel. So we have a channel with an automated workflow. When someone joins, they receive a message with a form they can drop down and choose what they want to help with. And that pops a message out into our channel, which tells the people in the channel, hey, this person wants to get involved in this thing. Here's a button for someone to onboard them and they press the button and then that assigns them as a buddy to that new contributor and they help them go through those processes. That's something that we're just literally in the early stages of starting, but it's something that would be really helpful to implement so that there's a very clear way for people to reduce that friction of getting through those first steps by having someone handhold them effectively. Something we're starting to do at the end of this month is having specific tasks that we call out in our newsletter, which send, we send out once a month, just telling people what's happening in our project. A couple of tasks from each team, which are well documented, that someone could literally just pick up and work on. So they have a very clear brief. And you can see we've got some like writing content, some are about fixing bugs, some are about adding case studies creating a new header for our Facebook page and group. So clearly defined ways for people to help, prefaced with more tick is made by people like you, here's how you can help, or something like that, like a call to action to try and encourage them to get involved. And then when we come to the team level, getting people started, having a way for someone to find across your whole community, good first tasks to work on. So we have a public JIRA board, which uh, filters across all of our projects for a label of good first issue. And this will be anything like I showed in the, in the newsletter list from the marketing team to the product and community team. But it's public and it's easy for people to find and access. Reaching out to people directly by email, social media, through Slack, if there's an opportunity, like if you've seen someone write a really great article on their blog, reaching out to them and say, hey, I really found that article very informative. How do you fancy writing a, an article for our official community blog? It's a really powerful way of encouraging people to make that first contribution. The power of the personal invitation. So recently we did an email because we desperately needed people to help us with organizing our conference. And we sent an email out, although it went from our Mortic instance, so it was a bulk email, it was as if it was from me calling people to action, basically, and saying, we really need people to help us organize this event. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. I'm appealing to you. Please step forward and help if you've got the time and the resources to help. And here's the kind of jobs that we've got that people need to help with. 
and please reply to this email and it will come directly to me as project leads. We had a phenomenal response to that. So it's not something you would use for every single task, but sometimes reaching out to someone on a one-on-one -on -one basis or making that personal appeal does actually make a big difference. And also timely recognition at the team level, I feel is really important. So saying thank you to people. And if you went to some sessions yesterday, there was a great one that was saying some people like to be thanked publicly. Some people prefer to a private pat on the back. Knowing that and knowing how your contributors appreciate praise or don't is important. But also simple things like being able to stick a couple of stickers in the post in an envelope having forum badges which are exclusive for people who contribute and maybe certain levels of those that they go up through the forum badges and you can't get those badges unless you contribute. They're all ways to kind of like encourage people to try and think about getting started and finding something that they can help with. And then at the local community level, one of the things we're working on at the moment is creating a blueprint so that our local communities have the ability to organize contribution events. In Joomla, we used to call them pizza, bugs, and fun. But contribution events where they all get together maybe at the end of a meetup or over a weekend, and they collaborate together and work on something together. So we're trying to put together everything they need to actually do that. And we're also trying to make sure that we have buddies or team leads to help that first time they do that in a meetup so that the next time the meetup leader is confident to kind of do it themselves. And also encouraging the, the people who are running our local communities to connect their attendees with the wider community because those attendees might not know anything about what happens in the wider project. So we encourage them to have a Slack channel on our whole Slack instance. So people are there, they have a place to go ask questions and talk in between the meetups. To have a local language forum on our community forums where they can ask for help in their own language and give help to each other in their own language as well. So it just connects those people up and it helps us to encourage them to get more involved with our project. So, We've got maybe our first contribution. Awesome, amazing. How do we how do we now encourage people to keep coming down and staying down in that regular contribution section? So how do we move them from helpers to being makers? Well, in this example, we had someone who was a small business owner and they were using the open source project to grow their consultancy business. And they help out now and then. So like if there's a bug or there's a feature that they need or there's something that they specifically want to help with, then they'll jump in and help with that. But they don't think about contributing regularly. They just don't make the time for it. But they kind of appreciate they should because they rely on the software. And so for this one, the main pain points we saw for people who sort of fit into this category were mostly driven by their own needs and interests and not so much by what helps the project as a whole. They actually just practically didn't put time in their calendar to contribute, which meant that they never got around to doing it regularly because they just didn't make time for it because they were busy people. From our side, there was no outreach from us to encourage them to contribute to the next thing after they helped with testing that feature or, or that bug fix or something. So they did that one thing and then they didn't hear from anyone. So that's sort of on us as a project as well. And these folks are maybe a little bit engaged with the community, but not massively engaged with the community. So they have some connections because they've done a few contributions but they don't have that kind of like feeling like they're an essential embedded part of, of the community. And another persona we had in this group of like trying to move people down from making one or two contributions to being a regular contribution are some of our developers. So freelancers, for example, who are working on projects for clients. Sometimes get asked to come back to our but it was quite a lengthy process for them. They had to write tests, they had to pass all of our code quality, which they ne didn't necessarily have to do for the client. And ultimately that's time that they could be spending earning money. 
So some of the pain points for this group of people were that just the time taken in contribution and review. So this is from a developer's perspective, but this can also be the case if you're writing a blog article, for example, and it just sits there waiting for like a month because nobody has the time or nobody takes the time to review it and get it published, which can be really demoralizing if you've put a lot of time into it. They sometimes have to choose between paid work and contributing. The clients are not always requesting or requiring the contribution of work. So that's something of an educational thing for us is like trying to encourage people who are contracting Mautic freelancers to actually insist that bug fixes in particular are contributed back to the project. And that's part of the project brief. And they don't really see the value necessarily in becoming a regular contributor. So the value of that could obviously be that as they raise their profile, they can get more work because people are aware of who they are and the quality of their work. So some of the things that we can do at the project level to try and encourage that coming down from being a helper into a maker, streamlining the review and feedback process across the whole project so how long it takes for, from people making a contribution to that contribution actually being finished and wherever it is put up on the blog or i don't know the meetup they want to start a meetup group and the meetup group starts make sure that that is as streamlined as possible and try to prioritize new contributors Triage Party, if you haven't come across it, is quite a neat tool that lets you do this with GitHub PRs. You can set up your own panel with queries for what you're interested in, like PRs from people who've never contributed before or PRs from people who have been waiting more than a week for a review, for example. Making sure that there's regular contribution events where support is available. So we're trialing this at the moment with our product team with a view to rolling this out across the whole project. Every Friday, we do Open Source Friday. You can search for that and find more information about it. But basically, Fridays are our dedicated community contribution day. We've had seven agencies in our community commit to providing their employees with a certain amount of time, like half a day or the full day on a Friday, to focus entirely on working in the community. And this has been really successful because people know that the folks are going to be around there. So if they've got questions or problems or they need help writing a unit test, they can go there for help at that time. Raising the profile of our contributors. So one of the ways we do this is with a minor release, we do a spotlight in our blog of some of the contributors who've contributed features to that release or been involved in the marketing or the documentation and just tell people about who they are, what they do, uh, how they contributed to the project. I also do a monthly shout out of the people who've contributed in that month, both from the individual and the organization level to share like how, how we're doing as a project and a quarterly roundup of everything that's happened in the community. So that also sort of encourages people because they see their names being mentioned and they feel valued and the profile is being raised. And then if it's possible, it's not always possible in every community, considering equitable ways to make financial compensation available for people who do contribute. So that might be in bounties, it might be through paid contributors. We're exploring several different ways of doing this, but so that people who are contributing and would like to contribute more, but they can't do that if they aren't paid for that and they can't get that payment through their work, it's really important. It does. It has really unlocked some contributors for us in our project. I'm happy to chat later about how we're doing that. And then at the team level, encouraging consistently, reaching out personally when there's a new contribution, but also when people are becoming inactive. So we use Savannah CRM, but Orbit also allows you to track this and it will notify us proactively of people who are drifting away. So people who haven't been active for say 30 days, and generally that thought is just like, hey, how are you doing? Noticed you haven't been active for a while. Um, do you need a new task to work on or has life just got really busy? Proactively involving people in team meetings and conversations and not just waiting for them to join in. And when they join a team meeting, giving them something to get involved with and coming back the next time to report on their progress is also skillful means for helping them get involved in your uh, project more. 
and giving credit where it's due. So we try to roll this all up into our all contributors list on our readme, which is everyone who contributes across everywhere in the project. So all contributors is a great thing to have a look at if you can incorporate that. And then at the local community level, when someone starts contributing, making sure you're connecting them up with people who are local to them so that they start building those connections and friendships. And if there isn't a local community, seeing if they'd be up for starting one, because there probably are other people in their local area. Creating a contributions highlight slide for meetups to include in their presentation deck, basically telling them, here's how to contribute to Mortic, here's the kind of tasks, here's where we're going to have people available to help you get started, we have buddies to help you get started, and so forth. And encouraging local communities to take on ownership of particular projects. So one that we're working on at the moment is a pitch deck. So like giving that to a community and saying, we'd like you to try and get as many case studies from your community written up in this pitch deck, and then pass it on to another community to work on another area like the design or something. It gives them something to really focus on together and feel like they've made a difference and they've contributed. And so now we come on to the succession planning. So how do we get them to go from makers to deciders? Not everyone will go this route. It's not for everyone. But the people that we had feedback for on this are people who are already contributing in their spare time and they're really enjoying it. It looks great on their CV. They want to get involved more, but they're just not quite at the point where they're ready to step up. And the main reasons for that were time commitments not having confidence or skills to lead the project or they feel like they don't have that not having the ownership of, pro of particular projects vision or direction and not feeling like they're making enough of a difference to be in that role so fundamentally i think this area is at the project level where you need to support people in terms of helping them move into a more uh, leadership and succession planning role Mentoring is invaluable to support those emerging leaders. In our teams, all of our team leads have assistant team leads, and we're always thinking uh, who's going to be the next people coming up, and we're mentoring them. All of our leadership roles have a specific time period. So someone is in that role for three years as a team lead, two years as an assistant team lead. And every year I do a one-on-one -on -one check in with them just to see how are things going? Do you feel like you're still enjoying it? Is there anything you need support with or any way we can help you do your role better? Which people do really appreciate having the option to say, actually, I'd like to bow out a year early, for example. Establishing this culture of up and out succession planning, I think it's really healthy in open source to have that constant culture of people coming into the project and not having this fixed stagnant leadership structure. Considering how those emerging leaders could maybe be supported by their employers. So this might be writing a letter to their manager to say, would you be able to enable this person to have half a day a week to volunteer and contribute to our project because they're doing amazing in these areas and we'd really love them to take on more responsibility. And this can really make a difference and organizations can often be really supportive of that. And wherever possible, trying to support these leaders in attending community events by covering their travel expenses so you're not expecting the people who are making your project to be paying to attend things that they need to attend in their role. So a sort of a fundamental thing, but it is important, I feel, for this level of role. So this slide is more of like a roundup just to give you some ideas uh, to take away. So you can reference this after the session. And I'm open to take any questions. As I mentioned, these slides are going to be up on my notice page and hopefully that will be tweeted out if the Twitter gods have worked. And uh, yeah, it should be available to you. So happy to take any questions that people might have from the audience. Thank you very much, Ruth. Thanks, uh, thanks for this very interesting talk. Um, yes, are there any questions in the audience at the moment? Um, because there's, um, then in the meantime, I'll read a question uh, from mm -hmm. our online platform. Um, is the idea of rewarding contributions not contradicting the intrinsic motivation of open source contributors? What feedback have you received so far? 
Yeah, I mean, it depends. I think it's really helpful to be rewarded in terms of being thanked for something, even even if it's just being mentioned in the release notes, for example. Sometimes I feel like you can be going, making loads and loads of contributions and, and nobody ever recognizes that. And sure, for some people, they don't need that recognition. But for others, if they don't ever get recognized or thanked for what they're doing, they may just not bother anymore because it, that's what they actually find helpful. So yeah, don't go overboard, you know, but I do feel it is important that you do you do recognize people. And then particularly just things, small things like sending out a couple of stickers. It's a nice thing to get a couple of stickers or a thank you postcard. We used to do that in the more in the Joomla community where you could send a thank you postcard to someone who's done something that's really helped you. Um, I do feel like that's beneficial. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much. Anything else from the audience? Yes. Thank you for the talk, Ruth. Um, now, now you were talking about, I would say, rather big communities with rather professional community management. Mm -hmm. Do you have any ideas or hints on how to work in, let's say, small and and uh, communities that that yeah, are starting to grow and, and there's not that much time probably available for for do lots of those things. What what would you be? What we would be your like 80-20 Pareto uh, t tip to start with? I think building, building relationships within communities as they're emerging is really important. I think setting the culture in smaller communities is also really important. But also making sure that you're clear on how people can contribute. So where, where you need help, whether it's in promoting the project or whatever. So we have a bunch of tasks that are written up, which we might not have anyone who's able to do, but they're written up so that if someone comes along with those skills, they can be like, yeah, I'll take that on. I know how to do that. So I think even if you haven't got all the people to do it, having the ability to say like there's these tasks available that we would like someone to work on is really helpful. Um, and yeah, just nurturing. So reaching out to people and who you see raising an issue and say, would you like me to help you figure out how to support that and then contribute it? Or people who are, who are asking about something missing in your documentation, just say, hey, would you like to actually add that? I'm happy to help you make that first step and learn how to contribute to the docs, for example. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? I don't think so. Um, thanks again, Ruth, for your talk. It was a pleasure having you. Okay. And hopefully you can Thank make you. next time we'll have you here in person. Fingers <laughs> crossed. <laughs> <laughs>